Yep. Jim. Um, <laughs> and uh, I'm going to hand right over to Dave, uh, who runs Stumbler Moulds. David. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name's uh, Davey, or Davey Price. Um, I'm the guy behind uh, Stumble or Pinball. I'm a mod maker uh, for pinball machines. Um, and today I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, what we do, um, how uh, it came about in the first place, uh, and some of the mods that we make and what the technology behind them is. Um, all right, let's skip ahead. Um, so this is just a little bit of an agenda about what I'm going to go through. Um, how many of you have seen this, this mod on the right here? Okay. This, is the, this is the Tokyo Neon, this is the one that uh, sort of kicked everything off in the first place. It's a mod for Godzilla um, and it's the first one that sort of, sort of showed me that I actually had maybe a viable business that I could uh, turn into something special. Um, but anyway, we're going to talk a little bit about what a pinball mod is. I'm sure most people probably understand what that is, but I'm going to go into a little bit about that. Um, what my history is, um, how I came to do this in the first place. Um, uh, what the current mod landscape sort of looks like and where the future of mod making might go after that point in time. Now, uh, I've watched a couple of seminars in here over the last couple of days and some of them have been really great and got a lot of audience participation. Um, if anybody wants to just heckle or stick their hand up or make a comment, then just go for it. You know, we can talk around anything you want to talk about. You don't have to leave your questions till the end. Uh, just get involved if you feel like it and we can, we can hash it out. All right, so what is a pinball mod? Wait. Hang on. So I don't think my videos are going to load by the looks of things, or at least this one won't. We'll see how we go anyway. So what is a pinball mod? Uh, a pinball mod refers to any change or addition made to a machine that wasn't standard on the original production. So usually that's by a third party, somebody who's not involved with the original production team or the manufacturing team. Um, and it could be anything, really. It could be uh, a 3D replacement for a 2D plastic. Um, it could be a toy that sits in the machine and does something, uh, um, uh, you know, like a lighting show. Uh, it could, you know, it could be something simple like just replacing the incandescent lights with LEDs. That could be considered a mod. Uh, speaker lights, toppers, all kinds of things. And uh, generally speaking, uh, yeah, so it also includes things like you see on the right here, whatever this is. Um, it in also includes rainbow puke LEDs. It also includes ramps that might alter the ball path um, and Happy Meal toys that get hot glued into games. Now, whether we like it or not, all of these things encompasses the pinball modding scene. Now, some people are going to love your Happy Meal toys that you've hot glued into your game and some people are going to think that you've absolutely destroyed your game. That's not up to us to dictate to people how, what they should do with their games, but this is all part of the scene that we have to recognise. It's not something that I get involved with, but, uh, you know, this is, this, is, this is pinball modding in a nutshell. Okay, uh, so generally speaking, mods fall into three categories. Um, We've got what's referred to as a static mod. Um, so that could be any, uh, any mod that uh, doesn't necessarily interact with the game. It might enhance the aesthetic of the game. It might improve on a 2D plastic by turning it into a 3D building. Um, it might, as you can see on the right, does anybody know what this mod here is on the right? Has anyone seen this one before? Uh, yeah, you seen it before? Yeah, yeah so it's a, it's a Mesel Mods. Uh, building for Avengers, yep, that's right. So you can see here it, it's, uh, you know, it's really nicely lit, um, but those lights come from the original lighting of the game itself, um, shining through some transparent windows in that particular mod. So strictly speaking, we'd still refer to this as a static mod. It doesn't actually do anything. It doesn't respond to any game events. Then we've got uh, second category of mods, which is interactive mods. Uh, this is one of my ones on the right here. Uh, this is for Foo Fighters, uh, it's an Area 51 mod that hasn't been released yet. Um, it's meant to replace the Area 51 building in the back left upper play field on Foo Fighters. Um, now, when we say interactive, um, that could come down to a couple of different things. It could be something as simple as 
having independent lighting on the mod that's tied into an insert or the GI of the game in order to uh, uh, react when the game does. So when the GI goes on and off, then the mod might do something in relation to that. Uh, or it could be something a bit more sophisticated, like having a microcontroller in the mod itself that picks up on those signals and then does uh, animations or events or triggers a server motor or a bunch of other things, depending on what's happening in the game at that time. Now, th this tends to be the type of mod that I like to focus on, just because it sort of um, uh, really interests me and plays into what my skill set is. Uh, which is programming and, uh, and circuit board work, which we'll get into in just a sec. Now, the third category of mods. Now, right, anybody recognize this one? Yeah? What, what is it? Yeah, yeah, it's, a, it's for Rick and Morty. Uh, it's called the Jerry Ramp. Um, and it is a mod that's designed to make it easier to hit the garage in Rick and Morty, which has typically been seen as quite a difficult shot. Um, it's quite hard to get like a nice clean feed off that top flipper, and it's a very tight shot to sort of get it around that bend and up into the garage. Um, so this, this ramp is meant to make that shot easier, uh, and it's been received really well, but it's not been without its critics. Um, people saying that it's uh, affecting uh, you know, it's, it's changing the original idea of the game, it's messing with uh, what the designer intended. Um, and, you know, I, I don't personally have an opinion on it, I think it's, you know, great work. Um, but, uh, you know, I think when people are making these kind of mods, they're always going to run into problems with uh, traditionalists who would see this as being too much. So, something to bear in mind. What's that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, yeah, does anybody have this mod? Well done. What's that? <laughs> <laughs> all right. What's that? Uh, are these all for sale? Yeah, all, well, these, this isn't my mod. Um, this, is, this is made by somebody else. But, yeah, all of these, this is still in production. Um, and if anybody does want any of these mods, uh, there's pin side lists that you can jump on to get on them. This one's called the Jerry Ramp. I, d I don't actually know the, the mod maker personally for this one. Um, but it's an interesting one to talk about just because it, it is a, a game-altering mod. There was another one um, made by uh, a guy called Swinx. Has anybody heard of Swinx? Yeah, yeah, he's an Australian uh, mod maker, good friend of mine. Uh, he made a Proton mod for Ghostbusters um, that utilised existing holes in the Ghostbusters playfield. Um, that everybody suspected were there for a mod similar to this in the first place. Uh, so he designed some proton beam rods that sat in those holes and covered up the outlines uh, when you initiated them using a foot pedal, I think. Um, so again, that's a game-altering mod. He, you know, got, got some sales from that. But again, there were some people who thought that that was too much and it was altering the gameplay too much. But it's not the same as the original Yeah, well, I'm... Yeah, no, that's clearly not, absolutely. But, but was, was it originally part of the design of Ghostbusters? Really? Okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, so in, in that particular case, you could say that, um, you know, that was following the designer's original vision. And whether it got pulled out for, uh, you know, budget reasons, or whether it got pulled out because they decided it was too much, uh, don't know. Um, but yeah, I think I think with with these kinds of mods, even though they are, you know, uh, incredible uh, uh, engineering uh, marvels at times, particularly with Swink's one, you know, it was very impressive the work that he did, you know, with those with those proton beams. Um, you can fall foul sometimes of people who don't want to change their games to that degree. Um, I suppose even for Ghostbusters as well, the extended flippers um, that some people have bought to cover the to cover the gap in the middle could be considered. Uh, you know, a game-changing mod in that regard. Um, and I know a lot of people who have bought them, installed them in their games, and personally I think if I had a Ghostbusters I would probably do that too because that gap's really annoying. Um, but some people want to keep the games as they are originally and it's just a consideration um, when you're making these things. Just, just a question, does anyone run a, like a game-altering mod? Anyone here in the room? Okay, interesting. 
What one? What one is that? Oh yeah, you do. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Good call on that one. I think, mate. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Okay. About me. Right. So uh, you might have picked up. I'm Australian. Um, I grew up in Australia. Uh, I grew up in the '80s. I was arcade obsessed as a kid. Uh, hence the Ghost and Goblins zombie that you see here. I found a nice animated GIF that I wanted to include. Um, I started coding. Uh, uh, very early on, um, I started out just doing uh, basic routines on my Commodore 64, just straight out of the magazines. I was reading Zap, if anybody remembers that one back in the day. Um, yeah, yeah Zizap, yeah, it was an English magazine, wasn't it? Um, but uh, yeah, around uh, 92, I started doing uh, bulletin board uh, programming, I suppose you would call it. Um, and ran a small uh, dial-up bulletin board in my parents' basement, uh, which was all pre-internet at the time, or at least, you know, to my understanding, it was pre-internet. The internet was probably there in the background, but I wasn't aware of it. Um, and then in '95, uh, went to university at the ANU to study um, software development. And then in the 2000s, I lost myself in DJing and music production in Sydney, uh, which was a wonderful time. Uh, and it was during that time uh, in Bondi um, that I was uh, going to pubs where there were pinball machines and having a great time uh, playing games like Theatre of Magic with my friends. And it was really there that I sort of re-engaged with pinball machines again. Uh, now, before that, I'd sort of touched on uh, pins in the arcades, uh, you know, played one or two here or there, but they never really uh, sort of struck a chord because I was so obsessed with the arcade stuff. Um, but it was later on, uh, you know, sort of in my mid-twenties that it, they really started to affect me and um, it was there as well that I, I had a party uh, that, I, that I put on and hired a couple of pinball machines and one of them was Creature from the Black Lagoon and the next day, once everybody had gone home, I was really hung over and just played that game until I finally got the multi-ball. And I think, it, I think it took me about three or four hours just because my skills were so bad at the time. But I managed it in the end. And it was, it was there that I really uh, got the bug for, uh, you know, sitting, sitting on these things and, you know, really getting good at them to the point of achieving, you know, what you want to achieve. Um, and yeah, I, I never, you know, I never turned back really. In 2007, I moved to the UK. Uh, I didn't intend to move to the UK. I was just there for a holiday. Um, but uh, I met my wife after about two weeks and then I never left. Um, and I'm still there. Yeah, <laughs> only just, yeah. Um, in 2018, I bought a dilapidated creech. Um, and when I say dilapidated, I mean dilapidated. That's, that's what I, that was the first machine I bought. It was inoperable, of course, as you can see. It had water damage. It was completely destroyed. Um, what's that? It needs to be, be captured. Yeah. Do you recognize it? <laughs> yeah. So that's the one I bought. Um, and it was, yeah, it was, I mean, look, I, I, think I, I, think I, I think I bought it for like 200 quid or something like that. It wasn't, I didn't, I didn't get done on it. But, uh, but it was completely destroyed. It was not working. Um, I, 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 in my naivety, I thought that the play field could be brought back. Um, when I started removing all the mechs from the bottom, uh, all the screws were breaking off. And I thought, that's fine. I'll just be able to drill them all out. And of course, you can't do that, can you? It's impossible. So... Uh, no, no boards. Yeah, no. So I needed to, I needed to get all of those again, um, and in, I mean, you know, I, I managed it in the end. That's what it ended up looking like afterwards. So, you know, it was uh, all's fair in love and war. But it was, it was that process of bringing that machine back um, that led me to mod making in the first place. Um, who knows about the chase lights on Creech? Yep. So they're the little lights that run around all the ramps uh, and they just go on and off uh, at certain points in the game. Um, now, if anybody's familiar with Creature, they'll know that those boards are renowned for overheating uh, and so more often than not, all the traces on those boards will be completely fried over the years so that um, if, there's ever, if there's ever a problem with it, they're really hard to uh, repair, 
particularly was for somebody at my skill level at that time working on boards, I didn't have the skills to be able to repair it and I think I destroyed the one that I had trying to repair it. Um, so it was at that point that I decided that I'd try and make my own solution to that problem and come up with my own chase board but with additional functionality. Uh, which led us to, and my videos aren't working, which is a real pity. Um, so I'll just have to talk around it. So I built a chase board um, that essentially was an Arduino uh, that listened to the uh, events coming into, uh, coming into the chase board and then drove a bunch of transistors to play patterns on the chase lights. And the idea that I came up with was that I'd use uh, uh, mathematical sine waves in order to uh, uh, do the brightness and the spin of, of those lights. So if you imagine a sine wave going like that, the very bottom of the sine wave would be uh, zero brightness and the top of the sine wave would be full brightness and everything in between would be middle brightness. So if you uh, extrapolate that across the chase lights without it moving at all, then half of the lights would be on, half of them would be off, and half of them would be uh, mid-brightness. Um, so then to uh, increase the interest, um, I then introduced a secondary sine wave, which then moved that brightness pattern back and forth in the same way. And by using sine waves in that way, rather than just having things statically on and off, it introduced a much more organic feeling to the way that they moved across the, uh, across the game. Um, and then playing around with uh, those patterns and uh, the width of the sine waves and the speed, uh, using things that were a little bit more complicated than sine waves, you know, waves that sort of did other patterns, I was able to introduce a lot of really interesting effects across those, um, across those chase lights. Um, now, uh, I originally, uh, originally built it using DC uh, powering, um, and ran into problems with that because it meant that everybody who was running LEDs in their, uh, in their ramps, half of the lights wouldn't work because of uh, polarity issues. So I had to go back to the drawing board on that one and create a version two. Oh, there we go, look, there's a, there's a picture of the, the Chase Echo. Um, so you can see the Arduino board, uh, transistors on the right hand side and a couple of shift registers and things and then dip switches down the bottom that allowed you to select the patterns. Um, now, this is where I began work on the second version. Um, this is when I was heavily into breadboarding. I don't do so much breadboarding anymore because it's like a nightmare. Um, but uh, this, is, this was the original breadboard design for the, for the second version of that board, uh, which was this one. Uh, uh, now, the chase board was using AC. Uh, powering to drive the lights, uh, which meant that the LEDs in the ramps could be facing in either direction, uh, which meant a much easier install for people. They wouldn't have to flip them around to get everything working. Uh, and this is the version that is still getting used today if, if we were still making them. Okay, the, the great thing about the Chase Echo, even though uh, you know it's sold in modest numbers, I think I maybe did about 40 of them or something, was that it, the code that I built for that led to the production of this board that you see here, uh, which is called the Lollipops. Um, you can see that I've, I've changed out the Arduino uh, to replace it with another controller. Jim, what, do you know, do you recognize this controller? Anybody else? Yeah? Yeah. So it's, a, it's an ESP family controller. This one's an ESP8266. Uh, the interesting thing about these controllers is that squiggly line that you can see at the top there, that's an antenna. Uh, and what that means is, is that these boards can create their own Wi-Fi uh, network um, that you can hook into. So when I discovered that these existed and that you could create your own web pages that could be served to uh, people's laptops or phones, it sort of opened up a whole new world of configuration options for me. No longer were you controlled by or constrained by dip switches on the board itself. You could suddenly create a web page for people where they could create limitless configurations. So now all those sine waves that we were talking about earlier could be minutely controlled by people using sliders and things like that. Um, now, because my software development background was heavily into web pages and uh, web development, uh, it just meant that I could um, suddenly start utilising all those skills 
to, to do this work as well. Uh, and that's really where things started taking off. Lollipops was relatively successful. I think I maybe sold uh, you know, 60 or 70 of those over the course of a couple of years. Uh, more videos that won't be loading. Sorry about that, everybody. Uh, but you can see on the left here an example of um, the web page configuration that I've made for this. We've got a color selector. Uh, you can select patterns up there and a bunch of other things. Uh, you can select when um, what happens when the uh, mod is at rest, which means that it hasn't done anything, and what it does when it's triggered by something. So the secondary aspect to this board was that it had a whole bunch of sensors um, that enabled us to pick up when switches or lamps or things are going off in the game and then trigger alternate animations uh, on the board itself. Yeah, I'm on it. Uh, so let's skip all those videos. Um, right, so which led me to the Tokyo Neon. Now, uh, a friend brought up the idea of doing a mod for Godzilla. Um, the same code that came from the Chase Echo went to the Lollipops, which ended up going to the Tokyo Neon. Uh, this was a er very early production run of it. You can see it's all pretty uh, rudimentary and, uh, uh, and uh, messy, um, but that uh, board then led to the final version, which you can see in the top right there. Uh, now, the story behind the release of this one was that, um, you know, I wasn't really expecting too much. You know, I'd had maybe pretty modest sales up until this point. Um, so I released it on a Friday afternoon because I was told that that was the best time to release it on Pinside when everybody's, uh, you know, bored at work and not wanting to do anything other than think about pinball. Uh, so I did that and then I needed to meet my wife in town. Uh, so I grabbed the kids, jumped on the tube and, and uh, took the hour-long train ride into the city. And when I jumped off, I thought, oh, I'll just check the, check the thread, see how it's doing. And by that stage, I had about 150 people who wanted one. Um, and that completely blew my mind, as you can imagine, and I was freaking out. Um, uh, but in the following day, there was uh, 300 on the list, and it's been growing steadily ever since. Um, Tokyo Neon's been a great success. Um, we've been doing mods since then as well, uh, you know, all utilising the same code that has uh, been moving on from uh, the Chase Echo all the way up the chain uh, and we're still using the same firmware. Uh, it's being shared across multi-platforms, got different configurations for different mods and so we're not copying the same code base, we're reusing the same code base, it's evolving constantly. Um, and it's been fun. Um, I think we're running out of time, aren't we? So we might have to Maybe finish up. Anyone got one, one question? The floor? So that's a really good question. Just for the video, the question was, how do you decide what game you're going to do a mod for? Yeah, it's a really good question. Thanks. It's, it's, it's a hard one. Um, Godzilla's really been a bit of a special game for, for, for everybody, really, for the pinball community and for, especially for mod makers. It's, a, it's the perfect storm uh, for a mod maker. You know, you've got dis destroyed buildings, you've got a Tokyo landscape, you know, that's ripe for, you know, really great LEDs and neon affying things. Um, it's sold in huge numbers. So it's, it's, it's really a great game for mod makers. Um, the trouble is with that, where do we go from here? You know, what games do we now focus on? Um, you know, I've got great ideas for particular games, but if the production numbers of that game aren't uh, big enough to warrant sort of really going after it, then sometimes uh, it might not be worth focusing on that, unfortunately. Um, sometimes you just do it anyway, just because you love the project and you just want to go for it, and more often than not we'll probably do that. Um, but uh, it's, it's a tricky one. You have to sort of, for, for me personally, I do a lot of uh, LED work, as you can see. Um, so I try and choose games that are conducive to that. Take uh, Jurassic Park, for instance. There's not a lot of uh, neon in Jurassic Park. So I probably would steer away from something like that and focus on things that are more conducive to my style. Yes, mate. Uh, <laughs> what am I, the, the question was, when am I going to launch a discount program? A loyalty discount program. I've been talking about it for years. How many, how many are you buying, Alan? <laughs> 10, 20, 50? <laughs> Yeah, and I appreciate that. Oh, thank you, mate. Um, you know, look, it's, it has been something that people have asked about over the years, um, and I certainly want to do something that, uh, that pays respect to everybody who's supported me over the years and, and 
gotten us into the position that we are today. Um, but I think it's critical when doing things like that that it's that um, it's applied evenly and fairly to everybody who's supported me through that time. So I want to recognise the people who have come with me on the journey as well as new people as well. And, and David, um, if people want to buy this, these mods, what's your website URL? Yeah, so the website is stumbleorpinball.com. So stumbleor is with an L-O-R. I'm not going to get into why it was called that in the first place, a really boring story. But it's stumbleorpinball.com. Um, and I'm also, uh, you know, always on Pinside as well. So if you post in any of the threads that, uh, that I put up on Pinside, then, you know, uh, that's another way of uh, getting on the list as well. Thank you. Thanks, everybody.